One of the questions that people ask me all the time is how do I share the gospel with people in the LGBT community? So today I'm just going to share some tips of things that I've learned out of my own experience and how to engage the LGBT community with the gospel. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Gospel Training Ground. My name is Ryan Haynes and I am here to help you live out your Christian faith in a post-Christian culture. So if you have anything particular that you would like me to address, leave me a comment in the comment section below. But today we're going to be talking about how to effectively engage the LGBT community with the Gospel. But before I start sharing some of the things that I've learned out of my own experience, I wanted to recommend some great resources to you from one of my favorite authors on the subject of homosexuality. His name is Joe Dallas and um, he, he himself came out of a homosexual identity, and now he's a, um, a happily married man. He's, he's a devout Christian, and he writes extensively on this subject. He's got tons of books, um, but the first of his books that I would want to recommend to you is called The Complete Christian's Guide to Understanding Homosexuality. It's a really big book, and it covers pretty much everything that you would want to know about homosexuality from a biblical perspective, so I think it's a great place for beginners to start if you haven't done much reading on this subject yet. And the next book that I would recommend to you is a book called Desires in Conflict. It's also written by Joe Dallas. And this book is specifically geared towards helping to counsel people with unwanted same-sex attraction. So if you have a friend who's maybe a believer who's struggling with this particular issue, this would be a great book to get for that person or to get for yourself so that you can understand how to walk them through the healing process. And lastly, I want to recommend Joe Dallas's latest book called Speaking of Homosexuality. And this book is really um, a book that's meant to give believers a strategy on how to talk about the subject of homosexuality with unbelievers. It's very practical. It has a lot of wisdom in it, and I think it'll really help prepare you to have some of these more sensitive and difficult conversations. So definitely check out those three books. I have links for each of them in the description box below, but I would also recommend that you check out my website, thegospeltrainingground.com, because I have a whole page devoted to giving you a list of resources on understanding um, sexuality from a biblical perspective. And you can also find the link for that in the description box below. But now let's get started. So I want to talk about how to just engage people in the LGBT community first of all and then I'll share some some important truths that we need to keep in mind as we're talking with them um, about the gospel but first of all let me just say that you know engaging people in the LGBT community is really not that different from engaging anyone else. Don't freak out about the fact that you're talking to someone who's homosexual or, or a lesbian or bisexual or transgender. Like, they're just people, and you engage them the same way you engage anyone else. But here's the first thing I would say about how to engage people in the LGBT community. First, I would just say be intentional, right? Like, if you know someone at your school or on your job or in your family or in your neighborhood who's LGBT, whatever it might be, make the effort to get involved in their life. Invite them over for dinner, you know, just hang out with them, go after them, make 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 opportunities available to be able to spend time with them and to get to know them. But here's what you have to watch out for. As you're making the intentional effort to get to know them, make sure you're not doing it just because they're gay, right? Our motivation should be that I want to get to know this person because I want to share Christ with them because they don't know Jesus and I want them to know Jesus. So it's the same motivation that should drive us to anyone else who's not a believer. That's, that's the reason why we want to go to them. And so so secondly, as you're being intentional to get involved in their lives, I would say that you must lead with friendship. I am convinced that genuine friendship is the number one key to being able to witness effectively to people in the LGBT community. You know, I can even remember when the Lord first put a burden on my heart to reach the LGBT community. And... Um, one of the first verses that he gave me when I was praying about this was Proverbs 27, 6, which says, wounds from a friend can be trusted. To go to someone and tell them that, that the identity they embrace, that the, the, the romantic relationships that they have are sinful in God's sight, that's a heavy wound. That is a hard truth to hear. But that proverb tells us that if they know that we are friends to them, that if we have genuine friendship with that person, they are going to be more willing to hear that truth than if we don't have any friendship with them. So seek to be a friend and to be a genuine friend before you seek to be an evangelist. Trust me when I say this, evangelism in the LGBT community is best done in the context of friendship. Okay, I've gotten to know enough LGBT people to recognize that being LGBT tends to be a pretty lonely experience. So one of the best and most important gifts that we can offer our friends who are LGBT is genuine friendship. So now the question becomes, how do I build a friendship with someone in the LGBT community? It's actually quite simple. You just do what friends do. 
Just spend time together. Invite them over to your house for dinner. Go watch a movie together. Like, find common interests and, and find ways to hang out around those type of activities. Like, just hang out. Just do what friends do. They need to know that you have a genuine care for them, that you love them, and that you want to serve them in whatever way possible. And probably most importantly, they need to know that they have a place in your life. And then, as you're beginning to develop this friendship with them, this is my third point, practice patience okay the first attribute of love that's mentioned in first corinthians 13 is patience and i think one of the best ways we can exercise patience towards people in the lgbt community is to be patient in sharing the gospel with them right so that means that when you first meet them or your first time hanging out with them you do not need to go from genesis to revelation you do not need to share the gospel with them that moment you don't need to tell them all of your thoughts and convictions about human sexuality because if that's the first thing they hear come out of your mouth it's going to turn them off instantly. And I'm not saying that we should shy away from the truth or compromise the truth or hide our convictions. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that if that's what we lead with, we're probably not going to have much of an opportunity to have a real conversation with them. Rather, I think it's better that as we develop the friendship with them, we should be praying in accordance with Colossians chapter 4 verse 3 that God would open up a door for us to share the word with them. So really all I'm saying here is don't force the conversation upon them. It will come up in due time. It will. They're either going to ask you what you believe about about homosexuality or just in the midst of your interactions together, you'll see the opportunity come up to start talking about Christ and the gospel and bang, that's when you want to enter in that door. And that leads me to my fourth point, which is honesty. Okay, when these conversations do come up, you need to be upfront and honest about what you believe and what the Bible teaches. Okay, it doesn't do anybody any good for you to just kind of uh, ignore the issue. All right, you need to be honest with them when these things come up. But of course, you need to do that in a very gracious way. Way. So right now, I'm just going to give you the line that I have used many times with my friends who identify as LGBT when they've asked me my opinion on homosexuality. And what I always tell them is I, I, I just look them in the eye and I say, look, I consider you to be a good friend of mine. And I think that friendship requires honesty. So I want to be open and honest with you and I want you to be open and honest with me. And after I say that, I'll just go ahead and share very simply what it is I believe, what the biblical basis is for it. And then I'll reply. And then after I share, I will ask them, now tell me, what do you believe? So that way it turns it into a conversation so they don't feel like I'm preaching at them. Even though I'm still sharing truth, they're not feeling like I'm just shoving something down their throat. I'm inviting them into a conversation and I'm reinforcing the fact that I care about them, that I consider them to be a good friend, and that I want to hear what they think about this subject as well because it's deeply personal to them all right now here's my last point as you're starting to have these conversations with them you need to make sure that you broaden the conversation don't just focus on the sexual stuff remember according to romans chapter one homosexuality and really all sexual immorality is an idolatry issue first before it's a behavioral issue. You have to remember that underneath their sinful behavior lies unbiblical concepts of God and an unbiblical worldview. And so you need to broaden the conversation to really start talking about those things. You ask them, what's your concept of God? How do you understand Jesus Christ? Like, What do you believe about the authority of the Bible? All of these things are relevant and all of these things actually shape someone's view of themselves and shape someone's view of their own sexuality. So these are conversations that that need to be very broad and we can't just narrow them down to only talk about sexual behavior. I find it very helpful and very effective to try to get them to see that their sexual behavior and their own self-identification is directly related to their view of God and their worldview overall. But I've also learned that as we're having these conversations, we need to make sure that we are not doing all of the talking. Okay, these people are people who have had real experiences and oftentimes some very traumatic experiences, especially rooted back in the early years of childhood. So we need to be prepared to listen to what they've gone through and to listen to their experiences because that's what friends do. And I promise you that in the midst of these broader conversations, you're going to have ample opportunity to be able to share the truth in love and to explain to them how the gospel is relevant to their lives. And honestly, like sharing the gospel with people in the LGBT community is really not that different from sharing the gospel with anybody else. In fact, one thing I think about, and I've actually said this to some of my um, friends who, who identify as gay or transgender, um, I, I bring up that verse in Romans uh, chapter 3, I think it's verse 22, where Paul says that there's no difference between Jew and Gentile, but all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I think in the same way, we can say that there's no difference between the heterosexual or the homosexual, but all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all 
are justified freely by his grace. So we've all got the same problem. It's sin, and there's only one solution. It's the cross, and that's where the conversation needs to go to. So again, like sharing the gospel with someone who is lesbian or bisexual or pansexual or transgender, um, it's really not any different than sharing the gospel with anyone else. Um, so always keep that in mind. And yet at the same time, I've learned that there are some particular truths that are helpful to emphasize in order to help them see that the gospel is relevant to their lives. And so in addition to the gospel message, I think these are some things that are very helpful um, for us to communicate with them. And I think that one of the first and most important things that we should do um, is to differentiate between the attraction and the action. And what I mean by that is differentiating between the homosexual attraction and the homosexual behavior. People in the LGBT community are without a doubt morally accountable to God for their actions. No question about that. But I do not believe that they are morally accountable to God for their attractions because they did not choose those attractions. You see, sexual attraction is not a choice that you make. Um, sexual attraction is something that you discover or recognize. It's not something that you intentionally choose. And this isn't just true with homosexual people. This is true with heterosexual people. I mean, I didn't just wake up one day having not been attracted to women and then all of a sudden like say that, you know what, I think I'm gonna start being attracted to women today. No, I just kind of recognized one day like, whoa, women. And in the same way, a lot of my gay friends that I know, like they just one day realized like, whoa, men. They were just attracted to men. They didn't choose to be. They just recognized that about themselves. And here's why this is so important to communicate with people, because so many people in the LGBT community have been told that they need to repent of their attractions. And then when they try to repent of their attractions, they're thrown into confusion and despair because those attractions did not go away. You see, here's the thing. Same-sex attraction is often rooted in deep gender insecurity. Okay, you can repent of a behavior, you can repent of a mindset, you can repent of a false belief, but you can't cannot repent of an insecurity. You can only be healed of an insecurity. So do they need to repent of any and all homosexual behavior? Absolutely they do. But can they repent of their same-sex attraction? I don't believe they can. Instead, I think they need to become secure in their gender identity and then the potential for heterosexual desires can arise as they become secure in who God created them to be. And that's the process that has helped so many Christians find resolution to their same-sex attraction. All right, now here's a second truth that we need to emphasize. We need to make it clear that they are holistically sinful in God's sight. A lot of times when these people have had conversations with Christians, they've only ever been told about their sexual sin, as if that's the only sin in their life. And of course, the impression that they get from this is, oh, if only I was heterosexual, then God would be okay with me. And of course, that's not true. That's a total misrepresentation of the gospel. The message of the cross tells us that we are sinners through and through, and we need to repent of all of our known sin when we come to Jesus. So don't show any partiality here. Don't place some unique emphasis on the sexual sins in their life. You need to help them to see the full range of of sins that they have committed and understand that all of these things condemn them in the sight of a holy and just God. And along with that, this is another thing that's very important to help them understand. God does not call them to be heterosexual. God calls them to be holy. The overarching principle that God gives to his people in scripture is to be holy as he is holy. And if you don't know what holiness is, I would encourage you to, to watch my video about holiness. I'll put a link to it on the screen here. But the basic gist of it is that holiness is about separation unto God. It's about submitting all of our lives to the loving lordship of Jesus Christ and walking with him in intimacy and joy. That is holiness. And when I talk about submitting to the lordship of Jesus Christ, I mean that includes submitting our sexuality to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, but it also includes submitting our finances, submitting our speech, submitting um, the way that we dress to him. It also includes submitting um, the attitudes of our heart and the way that we treat our neighbor. Literally, it's about submitting everything, our entire life, to the teachings of scripture and to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And now just a few more things. The gospel in its most basic sense is about reconciliation with God. But who is God? The most basic and fundamental aspect of our relationship to God is the fact that He is our Creator and we are His creation. So in the Gospel, we are being reconciled with our Creator, with our Maker. And this is exceptionally good news for people who struggle with sexual confusion or sexual brokenness. I mean, think about it. If you have questions or confusion about your body or your sexuality or your sexual expression, I mean, who should you turn to? 
I would submit to you that the wisest thing you could do is to turn to God, the one who gave you your body and the one who made you a sexual being in the first place. Remember, sexuality was God's idea, and the best thing we can do is turn to him and let our creator speak into our sexual brokenness. And really, come on, this is something that everybody needs to do, not just those who identify as LGBT. I have never met anybody who has not been damaged in some way by sexual sin. So everyone walks around with sexual brokenness and everyone needs to submit their sexuality to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and to let their creator speak into that brokenness that they would seek to live according to his design. And in order to help illustrate this point with your friends who are LGBT, I would say you should share with them about the things God's taught you about your sexuality. Share with them the way that the scripture has edified you in regards to sexual purity. And so your LGBT friends need to know that they are not unique in their need to be instructed by God about sexuality. You need it too, and it would be very helpful for them if you were to share with them how you've grown in the area of purity and your own understanding of sexuality in light of the gospel and scripture. And now here's one last thing that I think we need to communicate with our friends in the LGBT community. Um, when we're reconciled to God, we are not only reconciled to our creator, but when we're reconciled to him, he assumes the role of father in our lives. And this is so important. I don't have time right now to get into a full-blown explanation as to where same-sex attraction and gender insecurities come from, but it is oftentimes rooted in the child's perception of family dynamics, but most importantly, in the child's relationship with their father. I do not think that it is a coincidence that every LGBT person I've ever met has reported having a dissatisfactory relationship with their dad. And this doesn't necessarily mean that the father was a bad father. It just means that the child did not perceive that he received the love that he needed from the father. But of course, sometimes the father has been bad or abusive or non-existent, or maybe the father died at a very early age. Either way, um, I have yet to meet someone in the LGBT community who has said that they had a totally satisfactory, awesome relationship with their dad. In fact, it's usually quite the opposite, unfortunately. And this most certainly has an effect upon the way that the child views themselves, which affects their gender identity, which undoubtedly has bearing upon their sexual preferences. And again, if you want to learn more about this, I highly recommend those three books I mentioned by Joe Dallas at the beginning of the video, and also some more of the resources that I have um, on my website at thegospeltrainingground.com. The links for those are in the description box below. But I want you to think about this. If homosexuality and gender dysphoria and gender insecurity are oftentimes rooted in daddy issues, then God is exactly what these people need. Because in Christ, they will come to know the perfect love of the Father, and from Him, they will receive all the love, affection, attention, and affirmation that they might not have ever received from their earthly fathers. So that sums up pretty much everything that I wanted to say in this video. Um, I hope you guys found this helpful, and I hope that this is encouraging to you in your endeavor to reach out to your LGBT friends. You know, don't let people lie to you and make you think that you can't have these conversations with them, because you can. They'll be willing to listen to you if you lead with friendship and practice some of the other things um, that, that I said earlier on in this video. But definitely check out some of the books that I recommended, check out some of the other resources on my website. All the links are in the description box below. But until next time, just keep learning and keep sharing your faith. Hey, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, then I would encourage you to check out the rest of my channel and consider subscribing because you're going to find all kinds of other videos that are going to help you to understand your faith and share it with others.